Thank you, ladies. If you would, let's all stand. Thank you for joining us tonight for our worship service. Thank you, hymnals. Turn to hymn number 444. I love to tell the story of unseen things above. Join us on that first verse as we sing. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story more wonderful it seems than all the golden fancies of all our golden dreams. I love to tell the story it did so much for me and that is just the reason I tell it now to thee. I love to tell the story, will be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. On that last, I love to tell the story for those who know it best. Seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory I sing the new, new song, will be the old, old story that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Pastor, come right ahead. Amen. Good evening. How are you? So I learned something today. Turns out that is not a decoration. That, my friend, is a patty cake melon. No. A who? Patty pan. Squash. So apparently you carve that out and use it as a cereal bowl in the fall. Now, some people, I guess, cut this stuff up and cook it and eat it. And I, yeah, I'm not so sure. My wife sets that out on the front porch as an offering to the gods, and <laughs> even they won't take it. But the reason, <laughs> the reason I bring it up here to show you is because there's some gourds, what you call these, squash, uh, in the foyer. I think there's some okra and some other decorative things, and if you want to cook them, that's fine. But they're in the foyer, so avail yourself of patty cake stuff. Patty who? Patty Hurst? Uh, okay, never mind. And then also, don't forget, tomorrow night we're playing softball, right? At 6.30. And we're going to play at Comanche Trail. And so you want to come out and take pictures, if nothing else. We're going we're gonna to mop the floor with Midway Baptist Church. Amen? Uh, I, t I change when I get... When I get on the softball field, I change. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a trash-talking preacher on the softball field, so maybe you shouldn't come. It might not be pretty, right? You sort of like that in the office. Hey! <laughs> I saw this squash thing. I thought, how is he going to tie that into Elijah? I couldn't, I mean, the raven bring this to him or something? 
You could hollow that stuff out, and I wouldn't even eat Frosted Flakes out of that. I just, no, I couldn't do it. Take your hymnals, turn to hymn number 571. Hymn number 571, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, trust and obey. Join us on that first verse as we sing together. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. On that last, then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sins we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Pastor. Amen. Our scripture reading tonight comes from Luke chapter 1, verse 17. I know you're thinking, how do you get Elijah out of that? Watch this. And he, talking about John the Baptist, shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Let's ask God's blessings on our service tonight. Father, thank you for letting us be here. God, thank you for our church. Uh, we love one another, and Father, we love you, and we just ask that you'd meet with us tonight. Introduce us to this great prophet and show us what he said from you. And Lord, let it be meaningful in our lives as well. Bless us, we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
Thank you, choir. Aren't you thankful we serve a faithful God? Take your hymnals if you wouldn't stand. Turn to hymn number 79. If you need the words there on hymn number 79, they're on the screen if you need those. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. Join us as we sing. My Jesus, I love thee, I know I left the words on the screen. That's my fault. I kept thinking, no, we just sang that verse. <laughs> Start on the second line in Mansions of Glory. I'm going, in G. Oh, no, that's not right. Here we go. Here we go. From the, from the second line. In Mansions of Glory and Endless Delight, I'll have Lord. 
Lord, oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord, will you praise his name forever? Will you praise his name forever? Will you praise his name forever? Christ the Lord. Great job. Thank you. You may be seated. of hands so kind and tender they're leading me in paths that I must trod I'll have no fear when Jesus walks beside me for I'm sheltered in the arms of God. So let the storms rage high, the dark clouds rise. They won't worry me, for I'm sheltered safe within the arms of God. He walks with me, and naught of earth shall harm me. For I'm sheltered in the arms of God. Soon I shall hear the call from heaven's portals. Come home, my child, it's the last mile you must pour. I'll fall asleep and wake in God's new heaven, sheltered safe within the arms of God. So let the storms rage high, the dark clouds rise, they won't worry me. For I'm sheltered safe within the arms of God. 
he walks with me and not of earth shall harm me for i'm sheltered in the arms of god for i'm sheltered in the arms of God. Amen. Thank you, Brother Benny. Just making sure you get all the way down them steps. You make me nervous. Did you get a new knee, ankle, hip? Didn't, didn't get a hearing aid, though, right? We probably have an extra one around here somewhere. So they're always leaving them in the pew, so yeah. Not listening to that guy anymore. Amen. Well, tonight I want to introduce you to my new friend, Elijah. The spirit and the power of Elijah. Uh, the title of this series, The Spirit and the Power, I read a while ago from Luke chapter 1, verse 17. The angel came and was talking about the ministry of John the Baptist. And he said that he, John, will go before him, Jesus, in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And we're going to look at this. The, the life of Elijah begins in 1 Kings chapter 17. That's where we're going to be tonight. 1 Kings chapter 17. And if you want to, not tonight, but uh, in, in the week ahead, I think it's 2 Kings chapter 2, I was reading through the other day, 2 Kings chapter 2, and then yes, uh, I won't tell you how it ends, uh, but then Elisha comes on the scene. So uh, this week, if you want to read, starting in 1 Kings chapter 17, and read the, the story of Elijah, there's a couple of great books out there. Uh, I don't think we have them in our library just yet, but we will. One is uh, by a man named Leon Wood called Elijah. And uh, Leon Wood has written several books. In fact, Leon Wood, and we do have this book in our library, wrote a book called A Survey of Israel's History. And if you still, you know, are confused about the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom and which king went where, that book that's in our library, A Survey of Israel's History, will help you out a lot. But Leon Wood also wrote the book on the life of Elijah, and then Charles Swindoll wrote a book on the life of Elijah that's really good. It's part of his uh, Great Lives in the Bible series. Uh, so you can look those up on Amazon. Uh, go ahead and do it right now before we get into the heart of this message and order it, if you would. Uh, I know some of you are chomping, chomping at the bit to do that. But we're talking about Elijah. Now, when you're studying the Bible, you can study the lives of the great men and women of the Bible. That's a great thing to do. Uh, but something else to do is to study the patterns or the periods in the Bible. Somebody this morning was asking me some questions about uh, the Bible and how certain things fit together. Well, here's something you want to think about right at the very beginning in the life of Elijah. And by the way, I'm going to give you a lot of details tonight. I'm going to try and not speed up and run through them. But there's a lot of details right here at the outset, just so we have the stage set. Because you're familiar with Elijah and the, the cruise of oil and being fed by the, the raven and, you know, that sort of thing. But let me give you the details that set up the, the stage. Now, in the Bible, there are three periods that are marked, they're very dark spiritually, and they're marked by a lot of demonic activity. And the reason I point this out is because we find Elijah in every single one of those periods. Now, we're going to be in 1 Kings 17 eventually, but I want you to, to follow along with me. Well, I tell you what, let's start with 1 Kings 17. That'll make it easier, okay? Let's start with 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. The first time we see Elijah is here. Verse 1, it says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, 
said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. So the first period is this divided kingdom period. I'm going to talk more about Ahab in a minute. We'll talk about the history in just a minute. But Elijah comes on the scene right here. And it is a dark time spiritually. And here he is. The second time we find Elijah is at the beginning of the New Testament when Jesus Christ has his ministry there on earth. Now, I already mentioned to you Luke chapter 1. Go to Luke chapter 9, if you would. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. It's a dark time spiritually when Jesus is on the earth. Judaism had, had all but died off during the intertestamental period. Jesus comes on. He is the light of the world, we are told. And he begins to shine this light upon the people. And, and there's a lot of demonic activity. It seems like every other page, Jesus is casting out a demon from somebody. But look at, look at Luke chapter 9, look at verse 30. Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration. Luke chapter 9, verse 30 says, And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias. Elias is the Greek spelling of the Hebrew name Elijah. Verse 31 says, They appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. So the second time we find Elijah is on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now the third time we find Elijah is going to be at the end of the church age, at the end of the tribulation period. Now, in order to show you that, let me, I've got to show you a couple of verses, and it's important that you see these. So, Go back to the Old Testament, the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. Remember, we're setting the stage here for the ministry of Elijah. I'm going to show you something interesting. Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4 Look at verse 5, the last two verses of the Old Testament. God says through the prophet, he says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now that verse sounds familiar. It sounds similar to what we read in Luke chapter 1, verse 17, the spirit and uh, uh, power of Elijah. But notice verse 5. God says to Israel, Behold, I will send you Elijah. Okay? Now I'm going to send you the spirit of Elijah. I will send you Elijah. And Elijah will come before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That's the end of the tribulation period. So we find here in the Old Testament a promise, a prophecy, that Elijah, who we first meet in 1 Kings chapter 17, has a place in the last day's prophecies. Hmm. Let me show you where that's at. Go to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Look at verse 3. Revelation chapter 11, verse 3. The Bible says there, I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, 
Fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These, verse 6, these have power to shut heaven. Notice this. That it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all the plagues as often as they will. So somewhere in the last days, the the latter part of the tribulation period, these two witnesses, and they're not named here in Revelation chapter 11, but they will have this tremendous ministry. It will be a global ministry, preaching the gospel on the earth. Now, during the tribulation period, the earth will be filled with the wrath of God. The church will have been raptured out, And God will specifically be working on the hearts and the minds of the Jewish people. You can go back and read Daniel chapter 9 and find out. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26, I think it is. It might be verse 24. The the six things that God is going to accomplish in Israel during this time period. So it stands to reason... And this is, not a, this is not a sermon on Revelation, but it stands to reason. Notice there in verse 4, two olive trees, two candlesticks. Those are Old Testament symbols. So it stands to reason that the two witnesses are Old Testament witnesses. Now, the Bible says in Hebrews that it is appointed unto man once to die. Spoiler alert. I'm going to go ahead and spoil it for you. Elijah did not die. Right? He was taken to heaven in a fiery chariot. He never died. Now let me show you something else. This is really cool. Look at verse 3 of Revelation 11. They shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's one thousand two hundred and sixty days. 1,260 divided by 30, because that's the length of a Bible month, gives you 42. Go ahead, I know some of you are checking my math. 1,260 divided by 30 equals 42. These two witnesses are going to minister for 42 months. Let's do the math. 42 months is three and a half years. Okay? So they're going to witness, they're going to testify during the last half of the tribulation period. Now, notice there in verse 6. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. You want to see something really cool? Go to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 25. Luke chapter 4. Jesus is speaking. Luke chapter 4 and verse 25 says, But I tell you of a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, or Elijah, when the heaven was shut up. Notice this, three years and six months when great famine was throughout all the land. Isn't that cool? We find out that Elijah comes on the scene in chapter 17 and verse 1 of 1 Kings, and he says, I'm telling you right now, it's not going to rain without my word. And you read 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 1, and you find out, hey, three years. You're like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Pastor, you said it was three and a half years. That's true. But if we assume that Elijah came in October, and the early rains come in April, then it hadn't rained for six months before Elijah came. In other words, the judgment had already arrived, and God was just waiting to see if anybody else had noticed it yet. And then he sent Elijah the Tishbite. Jesus says he, he 
kept it from raining for three and a half years. The book of Revelation says that the witnesses are going to uh, witness and testify for three and a half years. And during that time, they'll be able to make it stop raining upon the earth. I submit to you that Elijah is one of the two witnesses. I think the other one is Enoch. I know there are those that think it's Moses because, hey, Moses was on the Mount of Transfiguration. And Moses uh, is a representative of the law. The problem with that is Moses died. Moses died and they wrestled for his body and then God buried him in a place that, that he didn't tell anybody. It's appointed unto man once to die. The only other man in the Bible that didn't die was Enoch. Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. So so we see Elijah in these three great periods of spiritual darkness and demon activity. All right, everybody's with me? You got all those numbers? Now, go back to 1 Kings. Let's let's get into the story of Elijah. 1 Kings, go to chapter 16 for a minute. Let's just back up and get a running start. 1 Kings chapter 16. The first thing I want us to see tonight is I want us to see the sin of Ahab, the sin of Ahab. Now, 1 Kings chapter 16, look at uh, verse 30. Verse 30 says, And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. Now, back up in chapter 12, where we were at this morning, where we were at in the first part of August, we talked about a man by the name of Jeroboam. Okay, We have a divided kingdom. We have the northern kingdom of Israel, We have the southern kingdom of Judah. We start out with Jeroboam. And from chapter 12 up through chapter 16, you have king after king after king after king. All the while in the southern kingdom, after Rehoboam dies, you have one king during this period. His name is Asa. He's a good king. In the north, you have all of these other kings. You have Jeroboam, and y'all have, uh, and I can't remember, I know Omri's in there, and a guy by the name of Tishbe's in there, and at one point, there are co-regents. Omri is the father of Ahab, and when we come to Elijah, Ahab is now on the throne of the northern kingdom, and notice there in verse 31, it says, As if it had been a light thing to walk in the sins of Jeroboam. Now, for the sake of time, you won't have to turn back over there. Let me give you the scriptures. 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 28 and verse 29, we find that Jeroboam, the sins of Jeroboam were one of convenience. Remember, Jeroboam set set up an altar in Dan. He set up another altar in Bethel so that the people wouldn't have to go all the way down to Jerusalem to worship. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 12 that it was a religion by consensus because he took counsel. I get the idea that that he sought out, you know, the popular stuff. I remember when we were living in L.A. early on in our, our ministry in L.A., we had a man by the name of Rick Warren showed up in California. And Rick Warren went down into Orange County and he went door to door. And he would knock on everybody's door. And he had a little clipboard. And he said, hi, I'm Rick Warren. And I'm going to be starting a church in your neighborhood. And I'm just wondering, what would it take for you to come to my church? Okay? And they said, well, you know, we don't like to get up early on Sunday morning. That's our only day off. Okay, no Sunday services. Well, we don't like that that long-haired, boring music. Okay? I don't want to wear a tie. Okay, and so he got this checklist of all the things that unsaved people didn't like about church, and then he started a church with all of those things. You see, 
It was a religion of convenience. Let's let's bring folks in and give them what they want, you see. That's what uh, Jeroboam did. The second thing there in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 31 and 32, was it was a religion of confusion. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 12 that, that he did not eliminate the high places, and yet he brought in all of the low people. The people that were not Levites, the people that were uh, of specious character. And he made them the priests. So not only do you have the altars at Dan and Bethel, not only have you eliminated the temple in Jerusalem, but now you have high places, places of convenience that are close to your house. And it doesn't matter how you dress and how you look and what you do. You just got to go and be religious. It also says that he changed the calendar and made it like unto the calendar that God had ordained through Moses. So instead of uh, a festival in the seventh month, oh no, no, folks are busy in the seventh month. Uh, the, the weather's nice and they want to go on vacation in the seventh month. Let's change it to the eighth month and make it like unto, close enough, you see. But there in chapter 16, Look at verse 32. Now we're talking about Ahab. And it says, And he, Ahab, reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. That's his capital city. And Ahab made a grove. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Now, I've talked about Baal worship before. I've, I've given some details. I'm not going to give graphic details, but let this suffice. When Caesar's army early on in, in the Roman uh, Republic marched into what the Bible refers to as Canaan, they came upon Baal worshipers, and it made them sick, to their stomach to see how they worshipped their gods. Roman soldiers puking their guts up at what they saw in this religion. And this guy Ahab, I love, I love back up there in verse 31, it says, as if it had been a light thing to create a religion of convenience and a religion of confusion. Oh no, he brought a whole conversion to the country. Because he took wife, uh, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Zidonians. Now, if you were to look at a map in the back of your Bible, you don't have to do this right now. But up in the northern part, uh, north of Israel, there are two city states: the cities of Tyre, T Y R E, and the city of Sidon, S I D O N. Jezebel's daddy was the king of Sidon, the Zidonians. His name is Ethbaal. Literally, his name was priest of Baal. So Jezebel was raised in a priestly home, in an ungodly, unimaginable religion. And she comes to town, and really, knowing the story, she takes over. It says that he reared up. That word reared up means to establish with certainty. In other words, Ahab begins to transform the entire landscape of the northern kingdom. Under Jeroboam, they, they might have had two altars. They might have had a golden calf. But the name of Jehovah came up every once in a while. The law of Moses was still in a part of the culture. But now with Ahab, all of that has been removed. No more of this Jehovah stuff. It is Baal and Baal alone. Baal is the god of storms. So when Elijah comes along in chapter 17 and verse 1 says, oh, by the way, it's not going to rain. That is a direct attack on the new God in town. You want to establish a new religion? You want to bring a new God into this country? Fine. I'm going to show you that he has no power. 
And so these people pray and worship and sacrifice and do all kinds of ungodly, sensual, fleshly, murderous things trying to get the attention of Baal for three and a half years. That's how bad it was. It's interesting, over in Revelation chapter 2, Jesus is writing letters to the seven churches and to the church there at Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 22. He says, I have somewhat against thee because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, to teach. That word Jezebel has become a byword. It has become a nickname. Think about it. Anybody in here know of Jezebel by name on their birth certificate? No. No self-respecting mother would give birth to a little girl and go, oh, she looks like a Jezebel. No. You name your daughter Jezebel, you're just asking for trouble. Amen? Ahab married this woman, this, this daughter of the priest. That'd be like me marrying Tammy Faye Baker. Not good, huh? My wife's been gone for four days. Y'all pray that she comes back. Look at, pray, pray she comes back after she heard that. Look at 1 Kings chapter 16. Look at verse 34. Let me show you just how bad it is. In verse 34, in his days did Hiel the Bethelite build Jericho. He laid the foundation thereof in Abiram, his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof in his youngest son, Segub. Segub. Now there's a name. Hey, Goob. I'm not going there. According to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Joshua, the son of Nun. Now that's interesting. Joshua. Joshua was the guy that took over when Moses died, Right? Go over to Joshua chapter 6 real quick. Joshua chapter 6. I told you I'm giving you a lot of information tonight, a lot of details. Joshua chapter 6, verse 26. Joshua chapter 6 and verse 26. And Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that riseth up and buildeth this city, Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and in his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. So the Lord was with Joshua. So we come to 1 Kings chapter 16. The Bible tells us about Ahab and how he's established this new religion. And then seemingly, just you know, as a coincidence... They stick in verse 34. Oh, yeah, this guy rebuilt Jericho. That's kind of an important detail. And it goes along with what I preached this morning. 500 years earlier, Joshua said, some Nimrod is going to come along and decide to rebuild Jericho, and he will be cursed. And now they've gone through this time period. They've gone through uh, the book of Judges. They've gone through Saul and David and Solomon. And now the kingdom is divided. And everybody has forgotten, it seems, what God said through Joshua all those years ago. You see, it's a very spiritually dark place when Elijah comes on the scene. You and I live in a very spiritually dark time. I don't know if you realize that. It is a dark time. As I've read history, I go back and I, I, I think about wars, the American Revolution and uh, the pilgrims, you know, before that, leaving to come to the new world, to have the freedom to worship God uh, after their conscience. And then there's the Civil War, the, the war of northern aggression, and, and the rebuilding of the country, and the dividing brother against brother. I think of World War II and Hitler and, you know, uh, all of that. And uh, we come through uh, Korea and Vietnam and 9-11. I think we are at probably one of the darkest, if not the darkest times spiritually in the history of the United States of America. And I'm not saying that to be an alarmist. I'm saying that so that you will realize that your eyesight 
has begun to dim and adjust to the light that is available. If we're not careful, we're not going to notice that the light is going out. Now, you and I are called to be the light. We are called to take the light. But if we're not careful, our eyes begin to adjust and we simply get used to the way things are. We see here the, the sin of Elijah, but let us also look at the, I mean, the sin of Ahab. But let us look at the spirit of Elijah. I go back to chapter 17, verse 1. I'm going to show you three things uh, and we'll be finished. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now, skip down to chapter 17, look at verse 24. And the woman said to Elijah, we'll talk more about her next week. But the woman said to Elijah, now by this I know that thou art a man of God and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. You ought to underline that. This, this woman, having seen these miracles, comes to a realization, this is a man of God. And this man brings to us the word of God. And he is a force to be reckoned with. He has the spirit and the power. So what is it that we can learn right at the offset here? What is this spirit of Elijah? Well, I see a, a, a singleness of spirit. It's interesting. Elijah came to Ahab. Now, if you've spent enough time in the Bible, if you grew up in Sunday school, you know Ahab is a bad dude, and his wife is even worse. And Elijah, all we know about him is that he is a Tishbite from Gilead. Now, just to help you out, a Tishbite is someone who comes from the village of Tishba. And Tishba is on the eastern side of the Jordan River over in the region known as Gilead. Remember they ask, is there no balm in Gilead? There is a, uh, 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 one of the cities, the, the, the cities of uh, refuge is there at Ramoth Gilead. So he comes, he's a country boy out of, you know, nowhere podunk holler. That's like you and I going to Washington, D.C. and standing before, uh, oh, never mind, that won't even work. I don't believe it myself. But going to Washington, D.C. and saying, hey, I'm from Big Spring and I have a message from the Lord. They're not going to listen. Start to say, Joe Biden, he wouldn't even know you're there, amen? I said it anyway. But I want you to notice this thing list. There were, there were no crowds. There wasn't a bunch of protesters. There wasn't any march, you know, down with bail. Heck no, we won't go. You know, none of that. It was one guy who stood up to the king, the most powerful man in the nation, and said, it's not going to rain. I love how James put it. James chapter 5 and verse 17. He said, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. You know, it's amazing what one person believing, seeking the face of God can accomplish in a nation. I think it was James who said, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah started praying and it didn't rain for three and a half years. I wonder if Christians got serious about prayer, what God would do. Seems like he told me in his word over there in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, that if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven. There's something about forgiving their sins and healing their land. You see, I see a singleness of spirit. He was a guy that didn't have any more sense than to believe that God would do what God was going to do. Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30 says, I sought for a man among them that should make up a hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. 
I wonder tonight if there is one person who would stand in the gap. One person who would commit to pray faithfully that God would be honored and glorified. I see here a spirit that, that is certain, that has a surety about it. He says there in verse 1, as the Lord God of Israel liveth. Now remember, keep in mind, at this moment in time, Baal is the national God. This is God's land, remember? This is God's people, remember? And one guy marrying a, a dingbat wife has decided, no, 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 let's take Jehovah out of the picture and we'll put Baal on his throne. And it seems like in this moment, in this little glimpse, this little thumbnail, if you will, that Elijah is the only one in the country who believes that God is alive. The darkest moment of his life, they're on just on this side of the flood. Job, having lost everything. Job chapter 19 and verse 25 says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth. Do you know tonight that your Redeemer is alive? Do you know that God is still on His throne? Do you get all worked up when you read the headlines and you see the way the world is going? Are you fearful when you uh, hear the preacher talk about the rapture and the tribulation and the, uh, the, the thousand-year reign of Christ? Do you get all nervous and worried? And, and, and rightfully so. Maybe you've got lost loved ones who are not ready to meet the Lord. I get that. Oh, but Christian, we ought to be praying even so, Lord Jesus come quickly. But again, here's another sad thing. We won't take the time to look at it, but write down Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 16 and 17. Deuteronomy, does that sound familiar? We've been talking about Deuteronomy on Wednesday nights. There on the plains of Moab before they ever crossed into the country, 500 and some odd years earlier, God said this. He said, take heed to yourself that your heart be not deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them and then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you. And he shut up the heaven that there be no rain and that the land yield not her fruit and lest ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. God warned them. He told them it would happen. And they thought, well, it's been long enough. God has forgotten I see a singleness of spirit. I see a spirit that is, is sure that God is alive. And then finally, I see a spirit of service because there in verse 1, he says, before whom I stand. In other words, to paraphrase, here is God, Jehovah, and I serve him. By the way, the name Elijah, it means my God is Jehovah. The minute he walked in the room, Ahab knew who he was dealing with. He's not dealing with another Baal worshiper. He says, my name is Elijah, and my God is Jehovah, Eli. Remember Jesus on the cross? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? J-A-H, Jehovah. That little letter I means my. My God is Jehovah. Everywhere he went, people were going to know who they were dealing with. Finally, in Psalm 135, listen to this. The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. Did you hear that? They that make them. Make them what? The idols. The idols that have eyes but can't see, mouths but can't speak, ears that can't hear. They that make them are just like them. They can't see. They can't hear. They can't make sense. That's who we're dealing with. A guy by the name of Ahab and his wife Jezebel. Keep an eye on them. We're going to learn a lot about them in the coming days. Stand with me if you would. As you stand, I ask tonight, do you know for a fact that God is real? Do you believe that he is alive in your world tonight? Can you say tonight that you serve Jesus Christ and him alone? Can you say that you would stand alone like Elijah 
if that's what the situation called for. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the testimony of this man called Elijah. We pray that in the days ahead we would learn about the spirit and the power of Elijah. We would ask that we would see your hand working in him and the strength and the courage and all that it takes to stand up against a a godless society. Help us, Lord, to adopt and to adapt the spirit and the power of Elijah in our lives. Bless now, Father, this time of invitation. As you move, may we respond, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing this evening, we'll open this altar up. Change my heart, O God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O God, may I be like you. Change my heart, O God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I pray. Change my heart, O God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O God, may I be be like like you. You You are are the the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I pray. Change my heart, O God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O God, may I be like you. As the music plays with your head bowed, Would you pray for our nation? Would you pray for the crazy things that are going on? I heard of an episode in a middle school in Odessa where a middle schooler attacked his teacher. We're living in those days, those times, people being murdered on the streets of the larger cities. It is a spiritually dark time. Pray for our nation and ask God to heal her. And I'm excited to tell you tonight that we have coming to present himself for baptism because he got saved this morning, our brother Ryland Foster. Ryland, would you stand here so everybody can see the difference that Christ makes? Amen. Let's give him a hand. (laughs) Ryland knows Jesus as his Savior and he desires to follow him in believer's baptism. And so, All in favor of Ryland doing that in the very near future, say amen. Amen. And if there's any that are opposed by like sign, of course there would be none. So congratulations, Brother Ryland. Welcome to the the family of God. Amen. We're going to be dismissed. We'll uh, come by and offer you the right hand of fellowship. uh, And we'll greet one another. Amen. Greet one another with a holy kiss. It's in the Bible. All right. So you go first. And while you do that, me and Patty Duke are going to the foyer. (laughs) I could get a lot of jokes out of this. Yeah, I'll, I'll milk that for all it's worth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless 
this week. Father, we are so thankful to have been in your house and we rejoice tonight that one has trusted Christ as his Savior. Lord, I pray for Ryland that you will just give him that assurance of his salvation. Father, I pray that you'll go with him always as I know you have promised. Lord, that you will guide his steps and help him to be a tremendous witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. May we all gather around him, Father, and be a good testimony. And Lord, if there's one more that does not know Jesus as their Savior, it's never too late to receive Christ. Let them do that tonight before we leave this place. God, give us a great week. Bless us as we attempt to serve you. Set a watch over our hearts and our mouth. And Lord, just let us go in the spirit and the power of Elijah.